What's going on guys, my name is Matt and this is a Lenovo ThinkPad X220, a laptop I purchased on eBay for under $75 and today I'm going to show you what it's capable of and some upgrades I made to bring it up to speed for some more modern computing. So this is the listing for the laptop I won and as you can see I paid $50 for the computer and $18 for shipping. The pictures weren't the greatest on the listing but it was clear there wasn't any major damage. My only concern was that it stated the battery was untested meaning it could be unable to hold a charge. I received the laptop in the mail about a week after the purchase. Opening up the box I found the laptop was packaged really nice in this bubble wrap sleeve which is something I've never seen before. Taking the laptop out, my initial inspection of the physical condition saw no major flaws and surprisingly few signs of use. Many times the keycaps and trackpad can be worn down for many months of use, but this machine looked close to new. The one thing I didn't realize about the listing was that this computer didn't come with a power adapter, so I hopped onto eBay and found a generic one for under $7. Even though I had to wait for the power adapter to arrive, I figured I'd try and boot the system up as the battery might still have some juice in it. Pressing the power button, I found it booted into Windows 10 right away. I then just tested some key functionality and looked into the system info to confirm the specifications. So let's talk a little about this laptop's origin story and the specs it's featuring. This laptop was released 8 years ago in April of 2011, making this guy pretty old in terms of technology. Diving into the system info shows this laptop has an Intel Core i5-2450M, which unlike desktop i5s at the time, mobile versions of these CPUs had only 2 cores and 4 threads. With a max turbo speed of 2.7GHz across all cores, this definitely isn't powerful by today's standards but considering this is on the legendary Sandy Bridge architecture, I have hopes that it should perform decently well. In terms of RAM, the system has 4GB of DDR3, which is an adequate amount for basic computers computing tasks, but this is definitely an area I wanted to upgrade. For storage, this laptop came with a 320GB 7200RPM drive. Taking out one screw and detaching the cover gives you access to this pull tab which you can use to slide the hard drive out of the system. The hard drive is encased in a thin metal cover with plastic bumpers which can be removed and attached to a different hard drive or SSD of your choice. Now this laptop only has a SATA 2 interface so you're not going to get full 6 gigabit per second speeds, but an SSD would still be a great upgrade. These laptops also came with an option for a 3G wireless card, which this particular model doesn't have but means there is an open mSATA slot that could be used for an mSATA SSD. These mSATA SSDs are basically predecessors to the more modern M.2 standard of SSDs that are much more common today. In terms of the physical features of this laptop, on the right side where the hard drive is located also features an always on USB 2 port, an ethernet port, an SD card slot, and a Kensington lock. The back of this laptop just features venting for the system fan and the 12 volt power input. I like this location a lot for a power input as it keeps the power adapter out of the way. The left side of the laptop features more ventilation, two USB 2 ports, VGA, a display port, and one of the coolest features in my opinion, an express card slot. This is an external connector that interfaces with the system's PCIe lanes. The big thing I want to use this slot for is an external graphics card. It can connect through this slot, which in my opinion is a much more elegant solution than having to open the system up and use the Wi-Fi card slot, which is what a lot of people do to get eGPUs on older laptops like this one. The bottom of the laptop features a number of screws, all of which are labeled which is pretty cool as it shows Lenovo is at least a little user repair friendly. This center cutout piece gives access to both DDR3 DIMMs. There are 4 rubber feet on this system itself and 2 on the battery. This is a 6 cell battery but Lenovo makes 3 and 9 cell batteries also. The battery easily slides in and out meaning you can carry a number of these with you and greatly extend your battery life between charges. There are a couple of drain ports in case you spill some liquid on the device and also this weird looking port right here. This guy's used to interface with a number of Lenovo docking stations that make it easy to transition from mobile computing to desktop computing with a monitor, keyboard, and mouse in a matter of seconds. The whole outer shell of this machine is encased in a really nice soft touch plastic which is an awesome material to use on laptops in my opinion. Opening up the laptop is a pretty smooth experience. Lenovo has a really nice hinge system that's very fluid and allows for a large range of motion. Getting into Windows is made really easy by way of this fingerprint reader which makes this 8 year old machine feel very futuristic and it actually works surprisingly well. Once you get an understanding for the proper way to slide your finger, I found an accuracy of around 90% which is pretty good in my opinion. 
Entering into Windows 10 that came pre-installed, I found the 12.5 inch 720p TN panel to be decent for what it is. It has bad viewing angles, which is to be expected, but it gets reasonably right and is perfectly fine for non-color critical work. The system also came with an option for an IPS panel, which I heard is quite nice and might be an upgrade I could try and do in the future. The keyboard on this system is regarded as one of the best laptop keyboards ever, and this is actually the last model of ThinkPad laptops to use this keyboard before Lenovo moved to a more standard chiclet style keyboard. I found typing on this board to be a pretty good experience, and while it's no mechanical keyboard, I can honestly say it's a contender for the best laptop keyboard I've ever used. The buttons are a good size and there's a good amount of travel with each stroke. Moving on to the trackpad, this is pretty typical of a trackpad for the time. It works fine, but I will always use an external mouse when given the chance. There are basic multi-touch features like dragging to select and two-finger scrolling but it's definitely a far cry from the glass trackpads we have today. The track point and accompanying clickers work well and I know a lot of people like them a lot, but for me, I just prefer a trackpad or a regular mouse. Diving into Windows, the system's reasonably snappy and works fine for basic computer tasks. Browsing the web, editing documents, and watching HD video all work great, but the combination of the 4GB of RAM and mechanical hard drive really hindered the potential of the system, so I decided to buy about $25 in parts and upgrade this guy to make the experience of using it much more enjoyable. I also decided to test performance and my experience before and after these upgrades. One really cheap upgrade that can make a big difference on an older laptop like this one is to change the thermal paste. Doing some research, I found an almost complete disassembly was required to gain access to the CPU die. This was definitely discouraging, but after some personal deliberation, I decided the hour it would take to do it would probably be well worth it. I started by shutting the system down and removing the battery. I then unscrewed all the back panel screws. This allowed me to release and disconnect the keyboard and then the trackpad. I then continued removing screws, the Wi-Fi card, hard drive, and even the screen had to be removed. A few more screws later and the main board was free to be pulled out. Flipping the board over, I found a relatively basic copper heatsink and fan assembly. I unscrewed the heatsink and removed the old thermal paste with alcohol wipes. I then checked the fan to make sure it didn't have a ton of dust and it was actually very clean. I applied new thermal paste to the CPU die and the chipset die. Now it may seem like I'm adding a lot of thermal paste and to some extent I am just because I want the entire die covered. This is because unlike a desktop CPU with an IHS, the heatsink interfaces directly with the CPU die and I actually like to spread the thermal paste out to ensure even coverage. I then reconnected the heatsink in a cross pattern to ensure even distribution of pressure and this meant the thermal paste change was complete and I needed to reassemble the system. I made sure to label most of the screws when disassembling, which made reassembly go surprisingly smooth. Booting the system up for the first time after reassembly was definitely a little nerve wracking as I was unsure if I did everything correctly in disassembly and reassembly, but sure enough the system booted up fine and everything was operational. Now I wasn't very smart because I forgot to record the before temps, but running it before and after of Cinebench, I found that the score improved slightly and the fan noise was significantly reduced. This leads me to believe there was a little bit of thermal throttling occurring before the pace change. In terms of current temps, the system now idles at around 42 degrees, and at full load hovers around the low 70s. These temps are good and what's really good to me is the fact the fans never ramp up to what I would consider loud. They're definitely audible under load and even at idle, but compared to a lot of laptops I've experienced, this machine is pretty darn quiet. Now that this was done, I knew I wanted to make some more upgrades and next came RAM. While 4GB is adequate, I found at idle Windows was using over half the available RAM, which meant just a few Chrome tabs absolutely wrecked the system. Upgrading RAM is simple, I ordered an extra 4GB SODIMM stick from eBay for like $10, took off two screws on the back of the computer, and this gave me access to both DIMM slots. To install the RAM, I simply inserted the end with the gold contact points into the connector at an angle, and lowered it into place until both clips snapped to secure the RAM. I then booted up Windows to make sure all 8GB was being recognized, and boom, I doubled my RAM for under $10. 
This RAM upgrade definitely improved the general usage experience of this machine as it meant I was running out of RAM a lot less quickly and was a welcomed upgrade as preparation for trying out an external graphics card. The next place I wanted to upgrade was the storage. I knew I wanted to take advantage of the hard drive that already came with the system, which means I had to use the MSATA slot discussed earlier in the video. What I purchased was a 128GB Micron MSATA SSD for under $20 on eBay. You can get higher capacities than this, but for a productivity machine like this one, 128GB for a boot drive is plenty. Installing this was a little more tricky than installing the new RAM was. To access the MSATA slot, I had to power the system off, remove the battery, and unscrew all of the keyboard and trackpad labeled screws. Then I pushed the keyboard forward to release it, lifted it out, and disconnected the connector. The trackpad comes out in a similar fashion, but the connector has a lock you have to flip up before pulling out the ribbon cable. I then disconnected a Wi-Fi lead that was in the way of the slot. Just like the sodium RAM, the SSD slots in at an angle, then lowers into place. But unlike the RAM, this SSD is secured by a screw. Once done, I reinstalled the keyboard and trackpad. I installed a fresh copy of Windows on the SSD and went into the BIOS to change the boot order so that the laptop boots from the SSD. Once done, startup times were almost cut in half, which was pretty awesome to see. Looking at before and after of Crystal Dismark also shows a huge improvement. With this being said, the SSD definitely improved the overall user experience. Boot up times, file transfers, program loading times, and just the overall snappiness of the machine can be improved by installing an SSD. This gives me a modest total of 448GB, which is way more than enough for this system. So let's talk about some other tests I ran. One major one was gaming. Now yes, without a dedicated GPU, the system isn't going to be able to play much of anything. But with that being said, CSGO at 720p low settings was playable at a little over 40fps. Definitely not good enough for competitive or anything, but for hopping into a few casual matches, the system worked surprisingly well. I also tested Rocket League, which at 720p low also produced a playable experience, which again is nice to see. I can't wait to get the eGPU up and running to see how much it increases performance. Another thing I wanted to try was keep an eye on how long the laptop battery was working. And this particular one was lasting around 3 hours at about 80% brightness, doing a combination of web browsing, video streaming, and document editing. I'm not sure how this would compare to a new battery, but I think for this laptop's age that's a decent amount of time, and I usually have my power adapter with me in case I need a little extra juice. Another thing I wanted to discuss was that this laptop's actually very portable. It's definitely not thin by today's standards, but it easily fits in a backpack and doesn't add a cumbersome amount of weight. For $75 for the laptop and around $25 for upgrades, the system provides a surprisingly good experience. Thinkpads like this one are bulletproof, easily repairable, and have a ton of parts available on sites like Amazon and Newegg. If someone told me an 8 year old laptop would perform as well as this one, I honestly wouldn't have believed them. I definitely have more plans for this guy. Like I said before, I'm creating a compact eGPU dock to go along with this laptop, and I'm going to test a gaming laptop setup that should have a total cost all in of around $200. If there are some specific games you'd like to see me test in that video, go ahead and leave your suggestions in the comment section down below. So yeah guys, I think this wraps this video up. Like the video if you liked it, consider subscribing, and this is Matt from Tech by Matt, signing out.